So first of all, uh, my name is Matthias Verkaufren. So I am the founder uh, and chairman of uh, the Ethical Technology Institute, which is a European uh, non-profit professional association for companies and basically everybody who wants to uh, use AI on a more responsible uh, and ethical way. But I will explain more uh, during the pitch at the end. So it's a workshop. It's, uh, yeah, it's virtually. So uh, this kind of format works a bit better physically, but uh, yeah, let's hope that technology does its thing. So it's, uh, the workshop is basically in three parts. So the first part, I want to do some polling, some, uh, some questions. I have like 15 questions or 14. So the first, um, 20 or 15 minutes will be polling. Uh, and then I want to engage in a conversation with you guys uh, on AI ethics, uh, how it's impacting your life uh, and so on. Uh, and then I will end with uh, a pitch about the Ethical Technology Institute, what we do, but uh, I also want to get your feedback um, about it. So it's really a bit of a conversation engagement I would like to have with the people here at the table. So let's uh, start immediately with the poll. Um, I'm using this app called the Mentimeter. So um, two ways to get going. So either way you take out your smartphone and you go to www.menti.com, uh, which brings you to a site um, where you can enter the code and you enter the poll. And I will go through the questions uh, one by one and so we can see the results on screen. Or you can perhaps open another tab and enter the link there. It's www.menti.com slash, and then there's this code. I will otherwise put it also in the chat. Just one moment there. I will quickly. So you have either the link like this, uh, put it in the chat or you can go to menti.com and use the code. Okay, I will give you guys a minute to get that done. Um, and normally you should see now the first question. I will also Okay, so I hope it works for everybody. So let's first get to know each other a bit. So the first question, it's, uh, it's just in which industry are you or your company active? All industries. Okay. public sector consulting. Okay, good. Take it to the next question. Perhaps. Okay. Second question. Do you worry personally what companies do with your personal data? Okay. So the majority does. Okay, good. Next question. To what extent do you feel that AI has a negative impact on your own personal life? And it's kind of a Likert scale, so you can slide from one, not at all, meaning I don't feel any negative impact, to very much, meaning that you're sense bias or sense some discrimination of some sort. Okay, good. Next one. Are you aware that 
AI applications could potentially have a negative discriminatory effect on citizens. And I assume you are all attending the responsible AI forum. You are aware of the implications of it, of course. Okay, next one. Um, so I don't know your backgrounds, if, if, if you're working for a company or more of a freelance or academic, but general question, how mature is your company or the organization you work with, with regards to AI? Uh, there are four answers there. So the one is uh, right, you, the company you work with or the organization you're involved in barely understand what AI means. Second, uh, you're just playing around with AI, but there's nothing that's in productions, no services, no products. Um, third answer is you provide one or two products or services where AI is involved. And then thirdly, AI is a critical asset to your company. Okay. Good. So you're all involved with some kind of AI. Good. Next one. Do you or your company test for bias in data or in models or uh, in the human usage of those algorithms or all three together. You can say, yes, we do, or no, we don't, or we do it partially, but not for all product services, or it's not applicable. Okay, good, interesting. Okay, next one. Do the AI models, uh, do the AI models your company create and or use within your products and services treat individuals fairly? It's your own personal opinion where you can say, yes, they do, or no, they don't, <laughs> or I think so, but I'm not sure, or it's not applicable. Okay, good. So you assume that they do fair. Okay, let's take it to the next question then. Do you think that establishing ethical principles is an effective way to address the flaws of technologies that promote bias and inequality? Meaning Will those principles help in some sort of way reducing bias? Okay, good. Again, uh, Likert scale. It's a statement saying, well, it will be easy to get rid of all the biases in AI system. Where you say, okay, I totally disagree with that up until there. Yeah, I agree. It will be a walk in the park. We are already over the half of the question. So, okay, majority has voted. It's again a statement. Personally, I am very interested in how others, meaning other companies, uh, other practitioners, pragmatically mitigate the risks of bias. Saying, yes, I am very interested and want to know, or no, not interested at all. Okay, good. Next one. Do you also lose track of what's going on in the overload of ethical principles, AI ethics frameworks and guidelines? You mean in, within the company or in the world? In the world, in the world. Okay. 
meaning everything that's being produced by academic research groups, uh, organizations, institutions, you name it, companies even. Okay, good, thank you. Almost there. Are you convinced that the upcoming European AI Act will answer the pra practical, ethical AI questions that companies are facing? Will this act be the solution? Okay. Okay. Next question. And this, I guess, is the final one. Will AI's decisions be less biased than human ones? A tricky one. Okay, good, interesting. Okay. Okay, that was it. Well, thanks already for this part of the workshop. It's uh, very interesting to see your guys' opinion. I will, I don't know if this will do anything more, so I will close this. Good. So let's, I also had the questions on slide, so I will skip those ones. Okay. Which brings us to our conversation. So you might sense a bit on the type of question where I'm a bit hinting to. Um, what I would like now like to do is a bit of get conversation going with uh, with everybody here. So we're with four or five people. Um, so I have a bunch of questions to get going. So a bit of easy questions, just also to, to get some examples from you guys, um, starting a bit more personal, but then working towards others. So first question I have is, um, oh, and clicked a bit too far. First question is, did you personally already experience an AI bias issue yourself? Um, I know there are a lot of examples uh, out there, mainly uh, American ones, or, uh, but do you personally already experience some kind of discrimination against you uh, by a decision of AI? And you can unmute um, if you like. I will probably answer, I don't know. If it has happened, I don't know. Yeah, that's indeed a bit a tricky part of it. Because, I was, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was going to say the same thing actually, because um, that's, that's the issue that in case um, there was some bias, it was as good detected that you didn't re really realize. What I sometimes realize is that for the recommender systems, they track a lot and they know exactly what I was looking at and give me very exact information of what I should be buying in the future. And, and, and often it makes sense. And uh, but that's not a bias, but but just how how my personal experience with AI was in the past. Yeah, so continuing on that, I assume it's just an assumption, correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of you already were influenced by AI when you did some shopping on Amazon, for example, and you saw oh, somebody else also bought this. And you clicked on it and you also find it interesting. And before you know it, you also order it. Just to give an example. I can confirm I I am it's my weakness. So I always do stuff like that. So and yeah, it's it's AI influencing me. And it to also continue a bit what Anna was saying, indeed, it's it's you don't know and my opinion there is a bit it's because it's companies are also not transparent about it it's not like when you go to your uh, 
uh, uh, when you buy a medicine, you know there are this uh, this big booklets uh, with the ingredients and what what's what are the side effects of taking the medicines. But you don't have that with um, products of AI. You don't get them when you uh, go to a bank and go for a loan. You don't get a booklet saying, okay, yeah, but because you are a woman. Uh, all alone uh, and so on and so on, you have less risks, uh, you have less chance of getting a loan. So the transparency is still lacking. And so that's also why a lot of people are unaware about it. And, and if I may add, also when you interact with the government, you don't know if certain decisions have been made by, uh, an, by, by uh, AI or not. So that's even, for me, that's even more worrisome than with private companies. Yeah. Yeah, effectively. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Very nice discussion. Let's continue to the next one. Again, a bit more general. Uh, which... AI ethical questions keep you awake at night? <laughs> Otherwise, if, if, if uh, I will go first. So th the things I'm most worried about, and that's basically also the reason why we founded the Ethical Technology Institute is um, I mean, I will, I will tell the story otherwise. I'm, I'm very passionate about the positive impact of technology and the positive things that AI can accomplish. Uh, so, and that's also a, what I do as my job. I, so I give consulting to companies on how they can implement AI for good and, 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 and so on. But yeah, I also have two kids who, who grow up and I'm, I'm, it shocks me what the negative impact can be of AI. And so based out of that fear and out of that frust frustration of uh, injustice, I see that AI can, can, can create, we found it ETI. Um, and so the things that keep me awake is okay, a bit, okay, how will AI evolve if there will not be some guidelines and will not be some, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, some some boundaries for companies uh, to to re reduce basically the negative impact. So that's a bit what's keeping me awake at now. So how can we make sure that those discriminatory negative impact can be reduced to a minimum? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the things that I will mention now, they don't really keep me awake at night, but I, I still found them very important in the sense that we need to find solutions. So first of all, it goes a little bit into um, the question that we were discussing before. Um, within my research, I, I look a little bit on organized immaturity, which is kind of a new concept in academia, but Basically, it goes back to the concept of immaturity and that has been in the philosophy for a very long time. But what it says is that people are starting to rely more and more on the decision making or on, on technology in general and therefore kind of outsource their own decision making. And maybe um, if, if uh, I may take you the example of your children, um, we see that children today use more and more technology. They, they are um, quite early already on social media and things like this. And um, I think that is quite an important issue that needs to be solved. And then concerning your, your second point you were making that we need some practical guidelines. Um, I also see very high level guidelines and you just mentioned that, mm -hmm. or you would just ask us the question whether we um, believe that the new act will uh, give us very good guidelines. And I think they will be good in the sense that they give us a broad direction, but they will be too high level to actually make implementable solutions for companies. So these are the, the two things that I find quite um, important and, and um, critical um, and not easy at the moment. 
I'm going to add that maybe it's not particular ethical questions. It's just the lack of companies asking ethical questions, what, what keeps me awake at night. Uh, the fact that maybe on the business level, the product level, the development level, there's nobody really thinking, uh, is, is this, should, should we do this or not? Is, is this okay or not? What implications is it going to have when we move it uh, to, to society and when, when we implement it? So I think that's what worries me, not, not particular ones. Yeah. Indeed, um, and and what's because I'm I'm from the industry, so I'm I'm basically doing consulting now for ten years. So at, at at big companies, mainly in Belgium, and what what we see is, and and you can uh, put that also in a global perspective, is you have in every industry you have one or two companies who really leading the AI development race um, and uh, basically creating this big gap with the other companies. So you take, for example, it's, it's a very obvious example. You have Tesla, who's really on the forefront of AI and self-driving cars and all that stuff. And then you have other companies, um, Toyota and you name it, and Volvo, who are basically a bit behind, but also want to step up, uh, step up in that race. And so they want that gap to uh, close uh, from a more monetary perspective. And you have those examples in every industry. And the least thing on their mind, what I see is the ethical concerns. So the laggards, what they want to do is close the gap with the forerunners. And the forerunners, they want to basically consolidate their, um, their position being a for forerunner of AI and they want to do it, they have their corporate responsibility programs, but it's easily for them to uh, slide into some kind of ethic washing and uh, yeah, do some it with some principles, but yeah, it's very difficult for them to uh, bypass the monetary uh, driver in all that stuff. and pleasing the stakeholders so it's 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 a very to sell ethics at a company and to a board it's very difficult and um, so yeah it's it's also something that 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 keeps me awake yeah right. okay I, do you want, want to ask francesca yes i have a question um because um you've been working with companies for over 10 years now so if companies approach you, what are the questions that they ask you personally? What are the issues for them? Well, basically, my my main focus the last uh, couple of years, uh, or, or where I started my career in, was data governance. So, um, the because the focus on AI ethics is just beginning now, especially in Belgium, for the last two years, probably. Before that, uh, the focus was on data governance and they basically come and say, look, yeah, I want to do stuff with my data. Uh, very, the first thing is simple BI, simple business intelligence, creating some reports, some advanced dashboarding. And then next step is some use cases where there's some data science and they want to do some fraud detection or uh, some predictive modeling, all that stuff. And then they, uh, very, very fast learn that their data is rubbish uh, and they would need to have a governance framework and they need to do data quality and master data, all that stuff. Uh, and so those are the main concerns now. Um, uh, and it's took a, a while for companies to realize, hmm, data is a critical asset and data should be managed properly. Um, and a lot of companies are now at that stage. And then you have a handful of companies, uh, in, like in some couple of big banks, uh, you know, in, in every industry you have some um, who know that and who, who do data governance for quite a while. And they're now creating some products with AI, chatbots and, and, and other stuff. Um, and the focus mainly is on the low hanging fruits uh, being, okay, how can we use that data and leverage for yeah, 
more clients, more you name it. Um, and in, in the hallways, you hear some people, yeah, what about ethics? And then the big question is, okay, ethics in, in AI is also important, but how do we tackle that? And that's a bit the point where the majority, that's my, my personal experience, um, somebody else can have an other experience, but the companies I'm involved with, they're just questioning, okay, we want to do something with ethics and AI, but how, pragmatically, how can we do that? How can I go into the office as a manager of my data science team, for example, on a Monday morning and then say, okay, look, uh, Joe and Anne, this is how we do the ethical stuff. That's what, what's happening now. And um, yeah, it's, it's a big, big question mark, big, big question mark. And I'm already even happy if they just do data governance, meaning that, that they have a solid base already to, to start with. Okay, uh, I'll put up the next question. To, uh, it depends uh, on your role. I don't know your, your roles, but how does your company pragmatically ensures ethical and responsible AI usage? Or do you know examples of companies who are doing um, some kind of uh, ethical, having an ethical framework or whatever, having a board of, uh, of something, uh, review board? Uh, how do you know examples of companies that do that? I can speak a little bit about an example I saw recently. It's, uh, I'm part of a nonprofit and we're working with different companies in Spain, uh, seeing how they are uh, doing, uh, ensuring ethical and responsible AI usage. And one of them is Telefonica, which is the, the biggest uh, phone and internet company in Spain, also in Latin America. And they, they have like um, a, a process that goes uh, all, all throughout the creation of, well, actually the, any decision because they work a lot with data. So they are like, they really transformed their, or that's what they told us. <laughs> they really transformed uh, their data culture. Uh, so everybody in the company was like all the time thinking about the, like prioritizing the, the um, the the user first and the client first so that uh so that there were like it, it like the priority was uh was always uh the privacy of of the of the client and then when they develop new uh products they uh have a system where they have like champions and they have like a, a questions and they have like all like a, a process that they need to follow in order to make sure that that product is going to be ethical somehow. So they have like full, full process and they keep improving it, which is the most interesting thing. It's not like set, it's something that they put a basis and now they, they keep building on it. Just yeah. to summarize. Okay, nice example. Anybody else an example? Um, I know here in Belgium, we um, have, uh, I don't know the example by heart. I just attended a webinar where they explained. Um, so we have this big uh, governmental recruitment uh, organizations called BDAB. Uh, so basically, yeah, if you're unemployed, you go to that, that uh, center, you, you can, as a company, you can put uh, vacancies and job opportunities on there, and then they do some, uh, you can, as a uh, job seeker, you can enter your CV, so it's a data bank, but it's also services, job coaching, all that stuff. So it's quite a big, well-known organization. It's uh, linked to the government, and so a couple of years, so they have also a lot of data, um, and then a couple of years, right, not so long ago, they started to develop some kind of a CV screening and matching uh, tool with a AI driven. Uh, but of course, one of the things, and I think they did that 
already quite some years ago, and one of the things that popped up were the ethical questions and how to mitigate the bias. And if I can recall it correctly, they indeed started out with some principles, like four or five principles, and then translated that into some uh, really pragmatical checks uh, on how to implement uh, the, the, or how to mitigate uh, the bias in their models. Uh, I think that's it's the thing that they do. But um, yeah, they they really um, are, are, are they really quite evolved in that. And the funny thing is that they've been doing that for like a um, couple of years now, let's say five six years. Uh, but it was only until last year that the the, the government the, the parliament uh, raised some questions concerning uh, the ethicality and uh, of of the, the decision making, showing a bit the increasing awareness on that also on a political level. Uh, so, but it, luckily for them, they they documented properly. They're quite transparent about it, so they can easily uh, answer the, the parliamentary questions but um, they were one of the very few companies i know about that really are taking it very pragmatically uh, the majority is still question marking everything so. okay let's take it to the next one okay this one i really like your opinion now. So should the different national institutions work together to establish an overarching European guideline or guidelines or guidance or framework for the ethical and responsible usage of AI? And with national institutions, I mean that, for example, in Belgium, we have AI for Belgium. It's a a uh, governmental created organization with uh, stakeholders from industry, but well as uh, academia, policymakers who on a national level think on uh, guidelines. In the Netherlands, you have the NLAI coalition. Um, I know in Germany, you also have, basically there are a lot of, in the majority of the countries, you have these institutions, uh, organizations, which are either funded by the government or funded by academia uh, that think about guidelines or frameworks on a national level. Question is, should they work together? That's one thing. Should there be an European one? What's, what's your opinion? So, <laughs> so I would suggest that it makes sense to have national ones or local ones, but also overarching um, institutions who work together, uh, maybe with an industry focus. So you mentioned AI for Belgium. Um, Professor Luke and I were actually um, also involved in AI for people um, who uh, have been establishing this year guidelines for different sectors. So that made, made a lot of um, sense as well. So. My, my short answer would be let's have both and uh, but of course working together and also um kind of bringing together all the um, stakeholders so industry experts uh, citizens um government universities everyone at one table to discuss the different perspectives and um, combine the expertise i would agree with uh, francisco probably and I would say that it's good to, because this is almost a political question. <laughs> so I would say uh, yes to go European because we have, uh, we share a lot in common. So we have a lot in common. So the decisions that we make, I think uh, can be, if, if there are representatives from the different countries, then, then I think they can, like we have a common ground. Uh, the question is what happens with the rest of the world. Uh, lately, I've been hearing this conversation that uh, that 
the ethical frameworks that we're building in Europe are like being imposed to other areas of the world. Like yesterday, um, I remember when we were, they were talking about autonomous cars, there was the, this man from Ghana and he was saying, well, your, your ethical frameworks uh, for autonomous cars, are they valid for my country? We're not building cars. So, you know, so there's that discussion. Yeah. But within Europe, I think that we can we can manage and it's it's good to have this European institution. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your opinion. Uh, I share a bit of the, the same and I totally agree you should have both because yeah, every country has a specific needs and a specific requirements. So you should have, and it will be the same with the European AI Act. You will have this European Act, but then every country needs to think, okay, how will I implement it with, with my country? We saw the same with GDPR. So you will have the same with uh, the AI Act, um, but indeed opening up the dialogue will, uh, yeah, will, I will be beneficial. Uh, not only limiting it indeed to the institutions, but also to the, the industry and to uh, individual thought leaders and so on. So, um, so yeah. Which brings me to the final part, which is the pitch of ETI and what we do. And uh, would uh, um, if you would stay around for just ten more minutes, uh, I would be very interested in your opinion afterwards. So. Um, I explained already a bit where we were founded uh, from. So basically, um, and I don't need to explain the details to, you, to all of you, um, but the positive impact that technology have, has is immense. But of course, it also has a downside. It can discriminate. It can have biases towards citizens, consumers, and so on. Children, uh, elderly, you name it. Uh, so there are a lot of examples, uh, like um, uh, these are a lot of American examples as well, Discrimin uh, discrimination in, in resume, recruitment, uh, in, in the justice system, and so on, healthcare. Um, so based out of that frustration and, and anger, uh, anger or um, fear, the Ethical Technology Institute grew. Um, so I founded it um, basically during uh, the COVID period um, between, uh, between yeah, my work uh, with the vision of, okay, let's create uh, a bias-free future uh, where, where companies and people can use technology, can use that on a responsible uh, way, ethical way, and uh, basically reduce discrimination and bias. That's a bit the vision. Um, and then secondly, I, I want to, to do that from out of a non-profit point of view, because uh, building something out of a non-profit view really a, is another kind of way of, of, of building uh, something. Um, so that was that. And then I, I um, gathered three more people uh, to that, more senior people. So I'm the, I'm the youngest one, the other uh, three are more mature, more mature and more senior. Um, and basically, we transformed ETI into this uh, nonprofit association, a trade association where companies, uh, institutions, and, and individuals can become a member of um, a, if they work with AI and want to do that ethically and responsibly. Uh, I always make a bit of comparison. Of, uh, with PMI, the Project Management Institute, because that's a bit the aspiration we have. We want to be the PMI, what PMI is for project management. We want to be the same for those who use AI and want to do that ethically. Meaning that there are three services we want to provide or develop for the members, which is on one part, education. The education focusing on, okay, on AI, how to do it ethically, responsibly. We thought initially, okay, that's very broad. So we scoped it a bit. Okay, let's focus first on bias. Okay, what is bias? How can we mitigate it? And so on and so on. And build an education program around it. That's one thing. Second, what we want to um, create is some kind of a certification. So this it's on a European level. So uh, some kind of a certification um, 
where people who follow or companies who, who follow uh, the education program can get certified uh, and so on. There are still a lot of questions about, okay, how will we do that and so on and so on. That's something that's the benefit of an association where you have members that it it's evolves with the members. And then thirdly, it's an association for the industry. So there's a lot happening in academic uh, industry. There are a lot of academic research groups and you, you know it. There's also a lot of things happening on European level, commission level, political policy. Uh, but there are very few things happening on the industry level. Uh, a lot of companies looking towards those other two. And uh, there's, as far as we know, not some kind of an European overarching association that's basically a bit also the spokesperson for those people um, towards the, towards academia, towards policymakers, especially uh, on what their needs is and how they see things. And those are basically the three things ETI wants to focus on. It's building this educational body, creating a certification program out of it, and hopefully have it recognized in the upcoming year. So it's a recognized certification uh, for companies that it's that they can say, look, we do AI, we do it ethically responsibly because we're certified, it's kind of an ISO kind of certification. And then thirdly, be an advocate for those companies. That's in a nutshell what ETI uh, wants, uh, wants to become. Um, so I quickly have a drink. We were founded uh, back in February this year. So basically the entire year we uh, focused on uh, founding up and starting up. So we are volunteers, so we do this on the side, but we really want to make this uh, happen and, 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 and make this grow. And there's, we've, we've been talking to a lot of uh, academic research groups, uh, mainly Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Switzerland. Uh, we've been talking also with, with some policymakers, with some thought leaders from the industry. Um, and it's, it's shaped to the association it is today. And we already have some people uh, on board. And in the next coming months, uh, our mission is to get more people on board and to really get going. And I will explain a bit what we will do. Um, and we're, um, we're very what we want to do as well is to get people on board on every uh, level. So we have, of course, uh, an advisory board, meaning so what we're doing now is building the organization, building this box, uh, um, this structure, but it needs content. It needs people. It needs expertise to develop the uh, education program, to develop the certification. And there's already a lot of stuff there. There are a lot of um, um, there are a lot of research groups that have frameworks that have ethical guidelines. Uh, and what we want to do is bring it together and kind of synergize it uh, and kind of synthesize it uh, and shape it towards an uh, an education program. So we have advisory board members. Here's one of them. It's Lode Lawak. He's a professor at Kairo Leuven here in Belgium. He recently published also. A book is a philosopher, uh, published also a book about robots. And we've been talking uh, with also other people in the industry. Unfortunately, at the moment, mainly people from Belgium, Netherlands, due to location. But we're really European-minded and we're really opening it up. Um, then the second thing is basically the main part is it's a membership association. So we need members. Uh, and... Um, at the moment, we're really looking for some kind of founding partners, so four or five companies, European, uh, who want to really be the first one. Uh, and to also set a bit the direction of the association, because that's the benefit of an association, and the members can shape it. Um, one thing I forgot to mention as well is um, reason for companies to join is also that basically at the moment they have three options. It's either they do nothing and wait until the European AI Act is there and confirm themselves. Secondly, uh, support 
kind this kind of initiative and uh, steer towards self-regulation and self-regulate a bit, or thirdly, do nothing. So uh, that's a bit what, what we're also hinting on. And so founding partners are really a, the first one, uh, first people, uh, companies who get involved. And we have a major one in Belgium who uh, who signed up now as the first. It's the Kronos Group. Uh, Kronos Group is the biggest consulting ecosystem in the Benelux. Uh, which uh, entails 300 companies, something like that. So, um, so they are the first one, and we're having talks with uh, other companies, also in Switzerland. One. Uh, so we hope that we have uh, four to five by the end of the year. So we have really something to get going. So that's that. And of course, we also have people who uh, say, "Okay, yeah." Uh, more individual people or companies who say, look, yeah, it's it's a very nice initiative, but I don't really want to commit or engage. Uh, so we see them as a supporter. And, and one of our very nice supporter is my, uh, Mark Kuckelberg. He's professor and dean, uh, vice dean of the University of Vienna uh, um, in Austria. So he also write a, he wrote the book AI Ethics and um, he's also a supporter of this. And we're also gathering supporters uh, around Europe uh, to support this our initiative as well, and it's it's also more from a marketing point of view. Uh, it it opens a bit of doors as well. So those are to give a bit an idea how uh, ETI will be formed with an advisory board, with supporters, but also with of course the core of it all are the members where we have founding partners but we have also different type of, of uh, members. Where we first initially were thinking on, let's focus only on industry, um, we were stepping back out of that uh, idea because it will be a pity to not involve uh, the, in, the different national institutions like an AI for Belgium and LAI coalition. So we need to have them on board as well. We need to have that discussion but also there are a lot of individual practitioners out there uh, who are working with AI day in, day out. They have opinions, they have ideas. There, there are those people who attend also these events like this, uh, who wants to contribute their knowledge and, and steer this direction as well. And so that's why we have multiple uh, forms of, of being a member as well. Uh, and I will... Yeah, with all the benefits of it, blah, blah, blah. So that's detail. Um, but that's the thing that we are um, uh, building right now. As I said, we're with four people. Uh, it's not in the order of age. So, uh, but uh, we have two people on the left, myself and Frank, uh, coming from the technology industry, consulting. Uh, and then the other two, Simon and Bruno, are from the association world, and they have a lot of experience uh, building associations and growing associations. And so with, with us four, and then with also already the people who um, confirmed, and I don't have the roadmap, uh, but perhaps it will be interesting to show the roadmap as well. Let me quickly show you the roadmap. Uh, which gives you an idea on what you want to do. So now you see the behind stuff. Okay. Okay. Hey, roadmap. And presents. So basically, um, as I said last year, uh, up until now, uh, basically, uh, the years are wrong, I see. Uh, so basically we started out February, 2021. So don't mind the, the years, they're wrong. Um, so we, up until now, we started out, created the legal construction, uh, getting some people uh, together, but also did a lot of talks. So we talked also with KPMG and a lot of uh, people and we shaped it till the association is today what we want to do next year is really launch uh, so we want to gather more people 
uh, and do a European launch event, say, okay, look, this is what we are, this is what we want to do, being that association, developing the education, certification, advocacy, uh, and uh, continue uh, to get people on board and, and start working on, uh, next year we want to start working on a, a guidance paper, uh, a positioning paper, uh, sorry, meaning that we will have the members it sit a bit together and write a position paper and say, okay, this is where we want to focus on this, what we want to do. And the year where the pre-summit, uh, a small event to a test event to then in 2023, I don't mind the years, 2023, do an actual summit, develop a first guidance document, and then continue that pace, uh, developing also the, the the certification and the education uh, uh, products, uh, and then switch uh, each year with a boot camp more regionally, where we come together, let's say, in Northern Europe, and bring together companies and really work pragmatically. So focus also on pragmatic implementation uh, of uh, ethical guidelines and all that stuff, uh, and then have the other year summit that's a bit uh, what we want to do so i've been rambling on now for quite some while what's your feedback how do you perceive this so yeah first of all thank you so much for sharing this great initiative uh, with us um i personally i'm i'm a researcher so I'm really happy that there are some initiatives like this. And my question um, to you would be like, because I, I always um, write, write papers and try to come up with ethical guidelines, but of course they are published papers and no product really. Um, so my question, and, and I wish to make some impact in practice as well. And therefore my question to you was like, how do you, think that academia or researchers could best contribute to your initiative. So, so what would be key tasks or insights that you would be looking out for us from us? Um, it's, it's, it's a very good question. And as I said, it's um, basically what we, what we search in the academia we approach is that they contribute indeed their knowledge, their, their expertise, what they've done in their research um, to ETI, have the dialogue with the industry. So because it's an industry association, so we bring those two together, have that dialogue and really focus on the translation. And uh, how can we translate those nice and very nice, nice things in paper to something pragmatical mm. that a member from a bank, for example, the head of the data science team can go to his office on a Monday and say, look, uh, I was on this uh, summit of ETI this weekend. Um, and this is, this, these are some really pragmatical tools. Let's implement them or go to the, to, to his board. And this is really an example of, of somebody that, that we spoke to. He said, look, I want to go to my board and say, look, we had this discussion with other banks uh, about ethics in AI. This is what we came up with. This is how we can self-regulate. So this is how we will do it now. And uh, that's what they are looking for. And, and, and that can only happen if there's this dialogue of mm -hmm. academia, as well as policymakers and other experts and have this thing going and focus on that translation of all those frameworks because there's this website that keeps track of all the different mm. frameworks and guidelines, and it's it's exploding. You, it's it's very difficult for companies to pick one. Yeah, yeah. And then a second thing to add, we also had um, a talk with um, it's it's an organization. It's called it's in. in in Flemish, so I tried to translate. It's called the Knowledge Center for Data and Society. That's how it's uh, translated. And it's been funded by the government. 
the Flemish government, and it's a uh, collaboration of two or three universities. So there are researchers also in there. And what they do um, is they build tools, pragmatical tools, like they designed the profile of a digital ethicist uh, and what their skills and competencies should be. Uh, but the agreement for the funding of the government was that they need to have those tools that they design on their research, have them implemented in the industry. And they were really asking us, and we basically aren't even properly established that asking us, okay, could you be the vehicle for us to translate it into the industry? Because they have a very hard time to get to know what the industry wants. They don't come to that dialogue or it's unclear for, the in, for them as a research group what the industry wants. And, um, and so that's a bit where we want to be. We want to be on that, at that, that, that crossroad and make, facilitate that translation. And the other way around as well. So we spoke to a lot of people from the industry and what they say is, look, there's so much abundance of everything. We don't know where to start. And we have that EU AI Act that's coming up. Uh, so what do we do? And so we want to provide them with pragmatic answers and, and a bit like PMI does for project management. You want to do project management here. This is our book. Follow our program and you're, you're good to go. That's what we want to establish. Yeah, amazing. I think it's a great uh, platform for everyone to be connected. Thank you. Yes, I, I agree. I think uh, I think the objectives are super clear and and to to the dot. So um, I would like to share with you. Now I have a meeting at ten. I have to run. Okay. But uh, yeah. Matthias, I'm going to book you a calendar because I'd like to share with you how we are doing this in the association I belong to in Spain because we have. Uh, PwC doing a lot of work for us, which is super because they <laughs> we also run on volunteers. So I'd like to share with you our experience. Very interested, yeah, for sure. Let's keep let's get connected. Yeah. Okay, super. Gotta run. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you everybody for uh, attending uh, the top.